Great, thanks, Stephen, and thanks to the organizers for the chance to present today. I'm really thrilled to share the aloe vera story with all of you uh, as a late stage leading allogeneic off the shelf virus specific T cell therapy company. As always, forward looking statement. And I'll start with this slide, which just shares with a few numbers a picture of where we are today at Alivir. And as you can see, we have uh, a robust pipeline of four investigational virus-specific T-cell therapies, or VSTs for short, that target a total of 12 different viruses and overall give us the potential for approvals across seven distinct indications. And I'm happy to tell you a little bit more later on about our ongoing three distinct phase three clinical trials that are uh, progressing globally. Um, and in part, they've, because of uh, the six special regulatory designations we've received for our lead program, Posalusol, enabling our um, rapid progress in the clinic. And now we have these programs up at over 100 clinical trial sites in three continents, North America, Europe, um, and Asia. We raised money this summer uh, to bolster our balance sheet and help us progress these programs. So starting with the patient, at Alivir, our aim is to address this critical unmet need that immunocompromised patients face of fighting viral infections that reactivate, whereas normally in a patient with a normal immune system, they would hold these viruses in check and not suffer the consequences of viral reactivation. And immunocompromised can be caused by transplantation, immunomodulation, chemotherapy, immunodeficiency, either primary or acquired through treatments, or even the extremes of age. And in that setting, these viruses often have no approved therapies or the therapies are limited efficacy or uh, problems with safety. So there's a real unmet need to have tools in the physician's tool chest to address these viral infections. And the reason for that is because once these viruses reactivate, they can have devastating consequences, including not just horrible signs and symptoms, uh, but prolonged hospitalization, end organ damage, uh, graft loss in the setting of transplantation, and even death. So what we do at Alivir is try to uh, directly address the cellular deficit that's causing reactivation of the viruses themselves and causing infection and disease. And so by that I mean uh, providing the T cells that are missing, providing the virus-specific T cells to fight the infection and eliminate the viral disease that's happening within the patient. And we do that um, with an allogeneic off-the-shelf product. And this schematic here just provides an overview of our innovative approach. And our founders uh, started working on virus-specific T cell therapy over two decades ago. And the process really begins with identification of the right viral antigens to target that confer protective immunity. We get our cells from healthy donors. This is a cell therapy, but it's a relatively simple process. There's no gene editing involved, and there's a single round of expansion. From healthy donors who have immunity to our target viruses, we isolate their peripheral blood mononuclear cells, we incubate those cells with proprietary mix of peptides and cytokines so that we get expansion of T cells, and at the end of that single round of expansion, we have a mixture of T cells that are highly polyclonal and highly functional and potent across our target viruses. And we're able to freeze down those cells and with the right algorithms from a relatively small number of donors can have enough HLA coverage to reach over 95% of potentially eligible patients and freeze down those cells with long-term stability so that we can pull them off the shelf and have them at, uh, to patients in need within 48 hours. You can see here our pipeline um, spanning four different products. 
Uh, our lead program, Posalusol, is a pipeline within a product. Uh, we've got three ongoing phase three studies, two in, uh, for the treatment of viral diseases, uh, virus-associated hemorrhagic cystitis and adenovirus. And then we also have a prevention study, which is moving further upstream and uh, really potentially having a transformative ap approach for stem cell transplant patients. We're also moving into solid organ transplantation with a phase two trial underway with posalusol. And then uh, I'll also like to mention that in addition to posalusol, which is a multivirus product targeting DNA viruses that are so common in transplantation, Elevir 106 is a multivirus respiratory product targeting influenza, parainfluenza, human metanuma virus, and RSV. And these four respiratory viruses combined uh, constitute significant uh, um, morbidity and mortality outside of COVID in the respiratory viral space for immunocompromised patients. We do also have a SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus-specific T cell therapy that's at the bottom, Elevir 109. Uh, we've seen really strong data from our phase 1B and compassionate use program as a proof of principle for the platform. And then we have uh, Elevir 107, which is a, a virus-specific T cell therapy that we're pursuing. It's in preclinical development for hepatitis B cure. So our clinical data really starts with this phase two CHARMS treatment study. Uh, this was conducted by our scientific co-founders at uh, Baylor School of Medicine. And uh, these patients were uh, post stem cell transplant. They had uh, viral disease related to any of our six target viruses that was refractory or um, uh, 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 non-responsive to current standard of care, experimental or approved, because many of these viruses have no approved therapies. Patients were enrolled and followed uh, over a course of six weeks for clinical outcomes. And as you can see here, 93% of the 58 patients treated had a response to the virus-specific T cell therapy with posalusol. Uh, and that included patients who had more than one viral infection. This is important because it demonstrated that you can take an off-the-shelf product with matching at, at least two HLA loci, but really enabling um, an, uh, the ability to, uh, again, create a bank of cells that can be used much more broadly than at single academic centers. Safety, very importantly, uh, demonstrated that as has been demonstrated at academic studies of VSTs, infusions were very well tolerated, low rates of graft versus host disease, no cytokine release sy a syndrome. And the, the strength of these data enabled us to receive not only RMET designation for both virus-associated hemorrhagic cystitis and for adenovirus, but to progress into phase three trials for both of these indications. And so um, conditioning regimens for stem cell transplantation uh, by the nature of uh, allowing a patient to accept a new immune system from a donor, uh, uh, remove the patient's immune system, and in doing so, create significant vulnerability to infections. And what you can see on this slide on the left-hand side is that um, following stem cell transplantation in that period of highest vulnerability, which is days um, through, through day 100 or 180, uh, when those patients have not yet fully engrafted with their new immune system, but their old immune system has been ablated to accept that graft, uh, they're at very high risk for reactivating these viruses. And you can see over 90% of patients reactivate at least one of our target viruses, and over 60% of patients will reactivate two or more of these viruses. So it's very, very common, but you don't know which of the viruses is going to reactivate. On the other side of the slide, you can see the impact, the clinical burden of reactivating these viral infections. It's associated with significant clinical sequelae, including an increased risk for non-relapse mortality that's directly connected to the number of viral reactivations that occur. So a common problem and a highly clinically significant problem. And as I mentioned, that window of vulnerability exists in the first 100 to 100 days post-transplant. 
And so you can wait for the patient to develop one of these viral reactivations, develop disease and symptoms, or you can take an approach of moving further upstream and giving therapy as a preventative approach. And that's exactly what we did most recently in our open label phase two prevention study with Posalucil was to say, in these highest risk patients post allo stem cell transplant, let's give them Posalucil early on and let's sustain them through this high risk window and see if we can reduce the number of patients who develop clinically significant infections from these target viruses. And so we presented the phase two data, a preliminary look at ASH last December, and then updated those data at the European bone marrow transplant meeting in the spring. And what we saw from the 26 patients who were treated with posalucil uh, post uh, stem cell transplant were very low rates of clinically significant infection across all six of our target viruses. And this, um, these rates were substantially lower than what's been reported as natural history in the literature or through electronic medical records analyses. And importantly, because our preventative regimen is giving seven doses of posalucil uh, over a 14-week period, we were looking very carefully at safety, and we were pleased to see that there were no new or unanticipated safety signals emerging, uh, very low rates of graft-versus-host disease, in fact, numerically lower than one might expect in this high-risk population. Uh, again, no cytokine release syndrome and, and infusions very well tolerated. So with, with the strength of these data in hand, with the potential to really uh, revolutionize the post-stem cell transplant journey for patients and eliminate that high risk of um, a viral reactivation, infection, and disease, we received our third RMAT designation from FDA for Posalucil. And uh, as far as we know, we're the only uh, product to have three distinct RMAT designations for one product speaking to its potential. And we also got the green light to move uh, to a phase three study for prevention as well. Importantly, when uh, you think about the clinical benefit for patients, that always comes first. But as you've heard from others today, it, it, you also have to think about commercialization, about access, and about um, are people going to pay for your, for your therapy. And I think here, uh, these uh, claims analyses, which have been published in peer-reviewed journals, demonstrate that there really is a significant economic burden to the viral diseases that we target. And um, this accompanies the clinical burden that patients experience. And so you can see on the left um, in virus-associated hemorrhagic cystitis, which is one of our indications in phase three, uh, irrespective of the presence uh, or absence of graft-versus-host disease, there's about a $200,000 difference in reimbursed claims for patients who experience uh, virus-associated hemorrhagic cystitis as compared to those who don't. Similarly, on the right, you can see in, um, that the uh, charges for reimbursed claims in patients who develop multiple viral infections increase dramatically as those viral reactivations and viral diseases um, uh, accrue. And so uh, we believe that um, having these data in hand to show that there's a real significant economic benefit to addressing both the treatment and prevention of these viral diseases in patients will be really important to have with us as we uh, look forward to bringing forward positive clinical trial results. And so here, I'm just going to end highlighting the milestones we have up ahead for our lead program with Posalucil. We're um, presenting the final data of our phase two, open label phase two prevention study at a meeting later this year. We're looking forward to uh, having a full data set there with a full six months of follow-up across all patients treated. We're also continuing to enroll that phase three trial of 300 patients globally. With our virus-associated hemorrhagic cystitis treatment study, that's um, ongoing as well, and we look to complete enrollment in the first half of next year. Our adenovirus treatment study, which is primarily a disease in pediatric population, that enrollment continues in both the US and Europe. 
And then we also, uh, as I mentioned before, have a phase two trial in solid organ transplant patients and specifically kidney transplant recipients with BK viremia. This is one of the dreaded complications of uh, kidney transplant is because there's no approved therapy and, and much higher rates of graft loss. And we're looking forward to having a, a readout in the first quarter of next year and really taking those data to determine next steps, not just in kidney transplant patients, but also solid organ transplant recipients more generally who also suffer devastating consequences from viral reactivation and viral disease. Um, and uh, I would say that our primary focus is on execution of our phase three trials. We're really looking forward to providing updates on um, with clinical data in next year and the years to come um, and supporting the development of allogeneic virus specific T cell therapies for many more diseases in the years to come after that. So thanks very much.